Hello, blogging heads. This is uh, Con Carroll, the uh, managing editor of the Heritage Foundation's uh, official blog, The Foundry, and I am here with uh, Zeke Webster. I am uh, uh, I am also one of the forum dwellers. I go by Don Zico there, and I have uh, my personal blog, uh, which is called Discord, and we'll link to that as well. So, what are we going to talk about today, Great. Con? Well, I think we should we should start off uh, telling everyone how how we uh, how we came to be talking today. Okay, um, I, I guess I should start this uh, this story. So, um, uh, I I've done two of the uh, Apollo dialogues, uh, uh, I guess, over the course of the last few months, and um, a few the weeks Apollo back. Apollo dialogues being being what for. For people who watch Blogging Heads, but... Oh, yes, I'm also. sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and the, the Apollo Dive Logs being the sort of, uh, I guess, amateur hour version of Blogging Heads, where um, people that are uh, frequent commenters or just people that, um, I guess, don't have the kind of credentials that uh, ordinarily you see on um, people at Blogging Heads could do it. So people, you know, that aren't currently working as bloggers or journalists or, um, you know, writing credentials position papers. Credentials is an interesting but, word for it. Uh, yeah, well, I'm never sure what exactly would be the best word for it, but that's, I don't know, if if you've got a better suggestion for what for a word that would distinguish uh, people like me from people like uh, yourself and the ordinary front pagers, you know, be my guest. Um, anyway, and so there's a, uh, there's a forum where people that are, uh, can, can uh, write down their ideas for things, subjects that they would like to do Apollo dialogues about. And a few weeks back, I um, put an entry into the forum saying that I wanted to do a dialogue about um, uh, the filibuster and holds and a few other kind of American political institutions that I think uh, we ought to change. And for a a while, uh, I didn't get any takers. And then somebody made a comment uh, suggesting that, um, I think the suggestion was that because Ann Althaus was a, um, I hope that's how you pronounce it, was a uh, constitutional lawyer, then, you know, maybe uh, she'd be interested in doing a dialogue on that subject. And I kind of laughed it off. But then um, another uh, commenter, uh, Preppy McPrepperson, uh, had a post uh, just kind of wondering if there wasn't some mechanic you could put in place uh, to have Apollo dialoguers do conversations with uh, front page dialoguers. Anyway, and so there was a big discussion on the forums about this. And uh, it was then picked up in one of the commoner core dialogues by Bob, who was, uh, or I guess I should use the full name, Robert Wright, the uh, the, the, the blog <laughs> father. Or, uh, yeah, I guess everyone knows who, blog, who Bob is. Anyway, and so he, um, <clears throat> and so he was talking about that, and basically his he's he his take was that he didn't see anything in principle wrong with the idea, but thought that very few. Um, very few, if any, front pagers would be interested in doing dialogues with um, Apollo dive bloggers or people in the forums or whatever, because you know we're we're the scum of the earth and, earth and all that. But um, uh, as well, it turns he, out, he also hmm? he, he also made the point that it was uh, you know a lot of the uh, people uh, had known each other before. It was kind of more collegial. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, but yeah, the, there That's also true. was a, a I think he even you know used the word stature and, and you know yes. made the point that you know front pagers wouldn't want to. I guess waste their time talking to the uh, the uh, hoi polloi of the uh, yeah. Babylonians. Well, I didn't even read it as that so much as that you know that a lot of people are going to be reasonably uh, sort of status conscious and um, and that there's there's a risk that you could come off sort of looking bad or it might prevent people from taking you as seriously if you, you know, spend your time doing dialogues with uh, people from the forums. Anyway, right. and so so it, that was and this blog is, this is where I, I entered the story because yes. I was uh, uh, watching uh, blogging heads uh, as I uh, often do mm-hmm. in the in the background at work, and uh, I heard this exchange and I was like, you know what, I uh, uh, actually, I mean actually this is this is actually the, the second time we've tried to do this. We've been trying to do this for a month, so the yeah. time issue did did rear its ugly head. But I was like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would I would love. To go ahead and have a have a session with a, with an Apollonia, I, I I think that'd be fun. And so I, I just put it in there. It's like you know I, I know I'm kind of low in the totem pole when it comes to blogging heads front pagers, but I'd be more than happy to do it sometime. And then uh, Singh, um, who uh, is the uh, political side of blogging heads um, uh, bookmaker, I guess you could say, 
emailed me a couple days later. It was like, hey, do you want to, we, we have one for you. Do you want to do one with uh, Zeke? And I was like, yeah, sure. And um, one false start and uh, a couple of uh, scheduling sna- snafus later, and here we are. Yeah, I, I think that the existence of this dialogue uh, proves that neither of us are familiar with the concept of sunk costs. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's, true. that's, that's true. I guess, why we're talking to each other today. So uh, Very good. what, was, our, what before, was the next item on our agenda here? Before we jump into the meat of the conversation, uh, I wanted to kind of, um, you know, ask you kind of uh, explore who you are. Uh, you know, when I first came to Blogging Heads, um, I was still with the hotline, um, uh, the blogometer, um, and my, so my beat was covering uh, bloggers. And so I always had kind of a uh, journalistic uh, inquisitiveness as to how they got started, what mm-hmm. motivated them, how they, how they got to where they are. And, and that extends to, to, you know, the people that are in the Blogging Heads forum. So since we've got a, a Blogging Heads forum regular here, why don't you, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Okay. Uh, well, I am uh, a underemployed recent college graduate. I uh, graduated from Davidson College this, uh, this past spring. And um, since I, I had the uh, the good sense to graduate uh, at a time when uh, North Carolina, beautiful North Carolina, where I'm currently taping this, had a, tw- a 12% unemployment rate, I am still uh, not particularly gainfully employed, and I and I spend some of the resulting free time uh, watching Blogging Heads. Um, I guess I got into Blogging Heads because I I've been a pretty avid blog wait, wait, reader. So, for, so did you oh, did sorry? you not watch it when you were did you not watch it when you were still in college? I did, I did. I was just I guess trying to make a, a touch of a joke here. So okay. uh, let me back up a step. Uh, I guess I, I started reading blogs probably when I was a senior in high school or maybe a freshman in college, something like that. Uh, I I I don't remember exactly how I found it, but I I stumbled onto uh, Kevin Drum's blog. And uh, I found it. I found both the um, content and the format to be a sort of welcome change from reading like op-ed pieces and editorial pages and that sort of things. So because I, I, I was I was already pretty interested in politics at this point, and you know, and I just kind of followed the links whenever whenever Kevin linked to various other people. He was uh, he was blogging at the Washington Monthly at this time, and I started reading first uh, a lot of the kind of the juice box mafia, uh, Ezra Klein, Matt Iglesias, uh, Spencer Ackerman, and kind of branched out from there. And since several of those people uh, periodically record Blogging Heads segments, uh, when they posted links to Blogging Heads on their site, I watched the videos. And um, I've kept watching because I think it's a really cool medium because it, it provides you a, um, a chance to see people, instead of kind of comparing finished arguments you get to see people react interact in real time and and in, in, hopefully at least you get to see people kind of think and react to other people's uh, arguments you know in front of your eyes in a way that you don't really get from written communication so uh yeah so i've been watching for a while and when they started doing the uh, apollo dialogues thing i thought that'd be i thought that'd be neat so i you know i sent an email saying that i'd be interested in doing that if there was anyone that wanted to talk to me about whatever, and and uh, eventually I did. I recorded a couple of those, and uh, I, I and uh, at this point I'm I'm doing this because it'd be nice to get on the front page, and because I really want to do a dialogue with somebody about the filibuster and so forth. So I right. guess that's I think where it was we are. To me as, I think it was pitched to me as institutional reform. Yes. And yes. then uh, the, with with the. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, with an emphasis on being the, being the main, yeah, right, right. Yeah, so do you want to go ahead and, and, and go into it and uh, tell us what your what sure. your pet peeve is and and your your take on uh, uh, the mm-hmm. Senate? Okay, well, um, yeah, I guess I'd say that the the filibuster and and a number of and a few other kind of Senate institutions that all that all kind of stem from the Senate's reliance on uh, unanimous consent agreements to move forward. Uh, have, cr- when combined with intensely partisan uh, politics that we have today, uh, creates the situation where we have a an excessive number of impediments to uh, democratic input on the political process. Um, and so, I mean, this has a, a couple kind of uh, incidental bad effects on top of the basic problem that it just makes our political system too unresponsive to democratic pressure. 
so, I mean, the basic way to formulate the argument would say that, you know, there's some desirable level of responsiveness to, ge- to democratic pressure in, a, in any given democratic system. You know, you don't want to have, there's good reason to think that a pure plebiscitary democracy works very poorly. But then, you know, when you get uh, past a certain point of unresponsiveness, it becomes impossible to even really consider it a democracy. So, like, if you were to look at... Um, a system so, like, so, uh, like so, China's, you know, they technically speaking have a legislature and they have elections and stuff like that. But there are so many places along the process where the popular, uh, where popular sovereignty is kind of diluted or controlled by the Communist Party that it's just not really possible to describe their system as democratic in any meaningful sense. And 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 so I think that given well, that well, you one can, might even say oh, that sorry. they were autocratic. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, I don't think anybody disagrees with uh, disagrees with me yet that you know there obviously there there is a point beyond which you could have so many impediments to um, electoral input on the system that you wouldn't really have a democracy, and simultaneously you can have too few. And so, I think at this point it's instructive to look uh, both at kind of past American experience and at other functional democratic states. And what you find is that you know we have. Right. With with the filibuster, I mean, we already have a, a larger number of veto points than um, than most, certainly than most European democracies, uh, which tend to be modeled off of more parliamentary systems. So, I mean, we're we're unusual in in having a, a strong bicameral system. We're you know we're slightly less unusual, but still sort of unusual in having a separately elected president and things like that. And then when you combine this and the um, and the uh, skewed democratic representation of the Senate with a, six, with a de facto 60-vote requirement to do anything. Uh, I think you really get um, unproductive levels of, uh, of potential obstructionism. And I think that what we've seen with uh, Barack Obama and the 111th Congress uh, is a pretty good indication of this. Now, the problem here is that my case becomes partisan, because we haven't really seen uh, this level of Senate obstructionism uh, and and the kind of partisan filibuster that we have today uh, very much in previous history. And so there aren't very good examples of a time when, you know, Republicans had a big legislative majority and, a, and, and controlled the presidency and an ambitious domestic agenda and the filibuster was in place. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to come up with very concrete examples of conservative policies that have been, you know, foiled by the structure of the Senate. But, you know, I think that when you when you look at the outcome uh, of the 2008 election and then compare the legislative accomplishments of the House and the Senate, uh, it's really dramatic what just this 60-vote requirement has done and how much more uh, responsive to the expressed uh, wishes of the voters in 2008, uh, I mean, isn't, isn't that isn't that kind of by design? I mean, you know, I, well, my, yes. my first response would be that you know we we are a republic uh, mm-hmm. for a reason. We're not a democracy, and the, yeah. the founders intentionally put in a bunch of uh, impediments to uh, the um, the passions mm-hmm. of the people ruling the day, so that um, it's designed so that one really bad election cycle or good election <laughs> cycle, depending yeah. on your point of view. Um, um, couldn't so switch the majority in Congress mm-hmm. that um, a whole bunch of uh, you know sweeping legislation could occur that the Senate mm-hmm. is in fact designed to slow down the House. Well, um, the thing is that the system would be designed as such and would still function as such without the filibuster. Um, and it's it's really erroneous to suggest that the filibuster was part of the constitutional design that was designed the, uh, and the whole system of checks and balances. That's um, true. That's true. We can, uh, we can go ahead the and filibuster say that the is, filibuster is, yeah. is not in the Constitution. Yeah, and if you, if you read the Federalist Papers, nowhere is anything like the filibuster mentioned. So the, the, the thing is that the Senate can function in that way, even with pure majority rule, because the Senate's not up for re-election every two years, because you know the the jurisdictions that senators are responsible to are different from the jurisdictions that representatives are responsible to, and because you know you also have to get past the threat of a presidential veto and you have to get through the judicial process. So I mean I think it's I think it's really understating things to say that 
like the democratic agenda that they're trying to pass is the result of one big election cycle. When you know, when you look at the um, electoral accomplishments that were necessary to be where we are, it's pretty impressive. You know, the Democrats, uh, they've for one, they've united their party um, to a pretty remarkable degree around um, a given sort of uh, a, a, around a given agenda. And then they've got um, politicians that are mostly on board with this um, agenda that have very large majorities in both houses of Congress and the presidency. And this this had to happen over the course of 2006 and 2008. And I mean, I I think you know your your argument suggests that well it would be fine for the Democrats to pass all these things if they had managed to reproduce the the um, magnitude of their wins in 2006 and 2008, again in you know 2010 and 2012. And I think that's a really unrealistic standard for uh, Democratic input on the process because just the um, the scope of the win in 2008 was, I mean, I don't we, we haven't had a, a presidential election that was won by such a large margin since, uh, I don't think since um, since George since the first Bush was elected. And so, and, and the thing is that, um, and we certainly haven't had 60 votes in the Senate since, you know, the Carter presidency. And even then, uh, I don't, that was a very different situation because you still had a, a lot more conservative Democrats and Southern Democrats in, in office. So, I mean, I think that if you're saying that the level of electoral success the Democrats had in 2006 and 2008 is insufficient to do things like, um, you know, pass labor law like card check or, um, to pass legislation regulating uh, the release of greenhouse gases, then you're basically saying that the level of democratic input required to do these things is practically impossible. And what I really want to emphasize to conservatives listening to this is that I think it goes both ways. That you know, like we, even if we didn't have the filibuster, it would still be mathematically impossible for the Republicans to get an, to win enough seats in the Senate in 2010. To repeal health care reform because uh, they'd have to overcome a presidential veto. And, you know, if, if we persist with the Senate, you know, it's I, I'm extremely confident that the Republican Party will never win 60 Senate seats uh, with the intent of repealing Obamacare, even if uh, Obamacare turns out to be really uh, ineffective legislation and even if, you know, they win the public argument. So, you know, we, I think that the the level of um, <clears throat> the the kind of level of, of dominance that the filibuster that the partisan filibuster requires to do anything of, of consequence is really unrealistic, and it presupposes a level of consensus about policy that we're that, that we're just not going to have, and that this you know and this becomes really worrying when you consider um, well I mean in my mind uh, global warming, but also the long term fiscal outlook. That it's it's hard to imagine ever getting sixty votes for um, well, let's, let's for a program that's actually warming. going to like eliminate our current deficit. But let's so go ahead and with global gone? warming just for a second. And okay. uh, I mean, because when you look at you know what the House actually accomplished on that front, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I don't know if you've seen that uh, great John Stewart uh, mm-hmm. bit on. Um, uh, oh, Captain I, I always watch John Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Right. And, and how he was uh, uh, bruised and battered heading over mm-hmm. the Senate. Um, I mean, it was it was a pretty completely ineffectual bill that made it out of these, you know, majority rule house. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, that that's what always, you know, um, uh, trips me up on these. The Senate is the problem arguments is that mm-hmm. when you when you look at what what the House is actually able to accomplish on some of this stuff. It's it's just not all all that impressive in in in, in your favor. I, I I don't see how the the House bill is 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 a great victory for uh, majoritarian rule, considering all of the uh, compromises um, mm-hmm. that had to be made that basically gutted cap and trade. Well, um, two things. I, I think I think I mean you have to do it relative. You have to consider the House's accomplishments relative to the Senate for the purposes of this argument. So while I'll agree that um, the Waxman-Markley uh, is a, a very, very flawed legislation, and I would certainly be far happier if we could pass, you know, like sim- uh, auction cap and trade without all these, you know, kind of carve-outs that, that either, you know, that I, I'd even be fine with auction cap and trade that literally rebates all of the proceeds of the auction back to the taxpayer or only uses the, re- the uh, 
proceeds from the auction to pay down the deficit or something like that. But, um, I mean, the thing is that even a very imperfect bill has to be compared to what the Senate has produced. And the Senate hasn't produced anything. And that's even with, you know, unprecedentedly large Democratic uh, majorities. That's even with the situation where the White House is threatening that the EPA is going to uh, regulate greenhouse gases in this highly, highly, highly suboptimal way. And, you know, and even with all this, they've been unable to pass anything. You know, so... I think what what your what your argument says to me is that um, dealing with uh, global warming is a really really difficult public policy problem, because you know, uh, no matter how strong the practical case is, it's still going to be incredibly hard to keep um, to to keep politicians from you know uh, jurisdictions that produce coal or other greenhouse gases to go along with it and. You know, it, it, that just seems to be one more argument for getting rid of the filibuster. Because even though it's, you know, it's unclear that even without the filibuster, you'd be able to get a worthwhile, or you'd be able to get strong enough uh, legislation through the Senate to deal with the problem. It seems to me just obvious that a 60-vote Senate's never going to produce legislation that'll be able to deal with the problem, or even any legislation at all. So. But I mean, and, and you've you've made this post this point, you know, some of your own points mm-hmm. is that you know, the the reason why the filibuster has become so much so much more commonplace, and it definitely has. Mm-hmm. You can just look at the stats to see, you know, even before the Republicans took over, you know, when the Democrats yeah. uh, were fighting Bush stuff, they were using it a lot more than had before. It's it, it's it's a pretty steady climb. Uh, both yeah, it's a are, it's a pretty remarkable climb, actually. If, right, if I open right, it up, I, I'll, I'll post a link to it. I've got a Ezra Klein post from I think 2007 that uh, that showed the the increase over time, and it found that you know in um, in 1980 there were less than 10 cloture resolu- resolutions in the uh, in the uh, 96th Congress, and in the 110th Congress um, there was something like 60. And there have been far more than that. I mean, it's it's just a really remarkable increase over time. But uh, right. I'm sorry, I think and I interrupted you. No, no, no. Um, my, my point was only that, you know, it, it's because that, you know, the Senate always functioned. It's a completely different body than the House. The Senate always functioned, as you uh, mentioned before, in unanimous mm-hmm. consent. And, you know, a rule you know, uh, a rule book like that would never work in the House. You know, the, the Jim Traffickens of yeah. the world. And... Um, uh, I don't want to name any current crazies, but you know they would just completely muck up the process. I'll, I'll name crazy. Only, <laughs> it only it only worked in the Senate for to. so long because it was such a congenial environment, which, which yeah. you know seems to be breaking down. And and I would argue it, it's 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 breaking down because um, you know the government is just uh, sticking its nose into so many more many things that uh, mm. people are becoming more and more partisan well, and caring oh, more and more care. about uh, identifying more and more. Uh, in partisan ways, uh, because of of how the government is intervening in their life. Well, I think that the um, I think that Senate congeniality was never a very stable equilibrium um, because you know well, it, it was for a good two hundred years before it shot up recently. Well, I I don't know about for two hundred years. I mean, it's sort of like when pe- whenever people talk about increasing partisanship, it's always relative to like the nineteen fifties and. You know, and and you mean, the, when McCar- you mean when McCarthy was there? Well, I, let me just say broadly the the era of American politics when we when we didn't have an ideologically coherent Democratic Party would be how I would define it, because I I think that we really had a um a, a unique situation that's unlikely to be reproduced in the future when you had both you know Southern segregationists and northern liberals in the same Democratic Party, and then you had a similar kind of ideological incoherence on the Republican side. I, I, I would, uh, my take on it would be that, you know, parties where everybody believes more or less the same thing, you know, parties where all Democrats are to the left of the Republicans in their particular constituencies, uh, just kind of makes more sense. And that, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to go back to the kind of... Um, ideological incoherence and therefore bipartisanship that we had in the 60s. And so when everything is reduced to kind of part, when you have this level of partisan competition, I, you know, I think it's just sort of wishful thinking to say, oh, well, you know, these institutions will work if we can somehow, you know, reestablish, um, reestablish uh, this kind of bipartisan comedy in the Senate. 
you know, and again, you can you can point to all sorts of examples of past points in American history where we didn't have anything resembling bipartisan comedy in 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 the Senate or in either house of the legislature. I mean, you, you, before the Civil War, you had you had a senator that was uh, physically assaulted by a congressman in this in the well of the Senate uh, of the Senate uh, chamber. I mean, <laughs> it's just kind of. Um, you know, and, like, yet, and yet the Senate, and yet the Senate was still able to get stuff done. Well, the Senate at that time didn't have a norm of the filibuster. You, I mean, well, I mean, they they had those rules, but but people didn't actually use them in an obstructionary way. In fact, there was a Matt Iglesias post a while back that I found kind of amusing, saying that, you know, really the South made a huge error in seceding when Abraham Lincoln won re-election because if they just knew about the kind of obstructionist tactics that are. Uh, that Republicans are using now, then you know why they had no reason to leave. They could have they could have prevented abolition forever. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think that's actually right, but but I, I thought it was a neat kind of tongue in, tongue in cheek point. Um, but no, I mean, sounds like a great what if novel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what? Well, what would you know, like counterfactuals are fun. But uh, but going back to your kind of initial point, I mean, I think that. Saying that we have we don't have as much bipartisan comedy because of greater government interference in um, in American life, I think that that's based on an assumption that if you had a smaller state, then we would have less significant political disputes, or, or you know people would be less emotionally involved in political disputes. But I I really don't think that that's true. I mean, because like, there are a number of issues where whether you have a small state or a large state, the government just kind of has to have some policy on them. So like, like take, uh, I guess abortion would be a good example. Is that there, you know, there are big, big groups on both sides of the issue that consider either um, ab- abortion's prohibition or its legalization to be, to be just really massive injustices. And, you know, you can't, you can't decline to rule one way or the other on an issue like that. You know, you have to have some law and it's going to be controversial just because we have, you know, very legitimate differences of opinion on the issue. And so, you know, even even if even if we could achieve a consensus about a more libertarian state, which I'm really skeptical about being possible, uh, I don't think that would mean that we would have the kind of consensus necessary to restore um, to restore uh, a uh, kind of friendly. Uh, not a uh, kind of uncompetitive Senate. So it, it's your thesis, though, that if we got rid of the filibuster, Washington would become magically a place to get stuff done. It's it's my thesis that Washington would be better at getting stuff done. Uh, it, it it certainly would still have serious problems that, uh, and because then you'd you'd still have all these issues with, uh, you know, regulatory capture and and uh, interest groups running campaigns and you know various things like that. But you'd have one fewer issue. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to misinterpret me as saying that elimination of the filibuster would make everything would make everything better. But I, I do think it would be an improvement. You know, and, and and I really I really wish that um it wasn't such a partisan issue because uh you know I, I keep saying Republicans whenever they whenever they win back the House I mean if it doesn't happen in twenty well whenever they win back the House and the Senate if it doesn't happen in twenty ten it's going to happen sometime I mean they're going to want to pass something. And, and and considering how much difficulty the Democrats have had at the height of their kind of electoral success for the past 30, 40 years, um, you know, I, I think that the Republicans are going to rediscover how, how, um, how unfair the filibuster is whenever it's actually used against them. And I don't know. Part of me actually hopes well, that that'll happen we'll because see. I we'll think just, that they'd I'll be willing just, to I'll change the rules. I'll offer a small prediction on health care here before we, mm-hmm. before we transition, but... Uh... You know, I healthcare is going to be a lot, especially this this law is mm-hmm. going to be very easy to. Um, you're not going to see it repealed right away, but you know, if the Republicans do take over the the House mm-hmm. in 2010, it's going to be pretty easy to make Swiss cheese of this law before 99 percent of it ever really gets enacted. Hmm. You know, well, uh, for example, in order in order to enforce the employer and individual mandates, uh, the mm-hmm. IRS is going to have to hire 16,000 new agents. Um, Republicans can kill that in the appropriations process. Uh, that, that's going to be a pretty easy sell. You're going to force Democrats to support voting for more money for a government agency that everyone hates to hire more mm. uh, tax collectors 
to enforce job-killing employer taxes and individual mandates. Uh, I predict Republicans win that vote. So now all of a sudden you've killed the employer in an individual mandates. You're you're a third of the way to killing Obamacare. Um, then you've got you know the the Medicare commissions and all the authority given to uh, uh, the Secretary of Human Health and Services to mm-hmm. define you know what what insurance company or what insurance plans uh, companies have to buy. Uh, that also is 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 pretty easy to 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 attack. And so all of this stuff through regular uh, appropriations processes is going to be pretty easy to dismantle. Um, and, you know, you don't even, you know, the government has to run, so Obama's mm-hmm. announcing you have to sign some appropriations bill yeah. uh, with the Republican Congress. Well, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how much they're able to get, to, to get done. Well, and, and I'll say right now that if, um, if the Republicans win big in 2010 or in 2012, and if, and if they're and if they want to use their majority to you know defund uh, the uh, the affordable the uh, Affordable Care Act or um, well, what's another good example of something they might want to do or well basically anything you know I, I think that Republicans should be able to enact their agenda with a majority vote in the Senate you know I think that you know it's, people always say you know oh well if if uh, if we get rid of the filibuster what's stopping the Republicans from you know gutting Social Security or Medicare and I say go for it. If the Republicans want, if the Republicans think they can win elections doing that, and they do win elections doing that, and they get a majority in both houses of Congress and the presidency going for it, they won. You know, I I won't have anything to say at that point. And you know, of course, we have disagreements about um, uh, apparently not only the wisdom of Obamacare, but but whether or not uh, you'd be able to kind of gut it that effectively through the revenue process. But then, you know, that's not really. That's not on our list of topics, so I think we'll save it for another day. Fair enough. Um, sticking on, sticking although, on our list of topics, uh, I thought I'd uh, go into uh, my alternative case to. Well, uh, hold on. Can, fix I, can I make um, Can I make one more point before we move on to that? You go right ahead. Sure. Okay. Well, um, since you were talking earlier about um, kind of separation of powers and and uh, limiting the uh, more democratic House of Representatives, I think one of the sort of underappreciated problems of the filibuster is that. It, like, congressmen are aware of how difficult it is to get uh, Congress to act on contentious issues. And one of the results of that is that it increases this tendency to, to have Congress delegate its power to parts of the executive branch. So the, the Medicare Commission you, uh, you mentioned was, was a good example, where basically the idea is that if you have Congress just decide normally uh, uh, like what new procedures Medicare is going to cover, then you're going to have a huge amount of regulatory capture, and between that and, and the difficulty of passing anything in the Senate, the ability that you know uh, uh, senators from senators from states that uh, you know like have device manufacturers or providers or whatever can easily band together on this, um, the the wonks all wonks are reasonably uh, reasonably in agreement that. Through that process, you wind up having Medicare cover too many things, and so the idea is that if you have some if you have some independent agency come up with a set of recommendations and then have Congress do an up or down vote with nothing else with uh, you know uh, with no opportunity opportunity for amendments, then that makes it easier to get better policy through Congress. You see the same you see the same thing uh, I, I would say with uh, the Federal Reserve in uh, in the kind of uh, economic crisis last year where. You know, there were very sharp limits to what Obama could push through in terms of the size of the stimulus. And so instead of seeing, like, Congress, manage, Congress managing it, you saw unelected bureaucrats in the Federal Reserve doing all these sorts of exotic, unprecedented things to inject cash into the economy. And, you know... I think, I think this is a great transition to what I was talking about, because this brings us right up into TARP, which is yeah. the ultimate delegation of authority. Mm-hmm. Uh, Congress basically said, we suck, we're going to write uh, the Treasury Secretary a $700 billion check, and basically, um, we're going to we're gonna write in the legislation that he can do whatever he wants, mm-hmm. and no one can stop him. Yeah. Uh, so you're for this. You think this is a great uh, I am, delegation of powers by I, Congress? I think, I think it was horrible, but necessary. Um, <laughs> essentially, is that basically, I, I mean, I don't know yeah, as much I, as I would I like to. I strongly disagree. Well, and I think most people in America do with me. Well, well, let me let me 
justify myself real quickly. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll start with a caveat that I don't understand the macroeconomics of this as well as I would like to. But my... You don't understand the macroeconomics of it. You just understand the, 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 well, the politics of, well, of just the enormous, um, unprecedented of giving that amount of money to one official in the government mm-hmm. with basically zero strings attached. Well, okay, let me let me put it this way. Um, I believe the people that told us that if we didn't do this, the uh, the economy would collapse. Um, I I am pretty well convinced that if we had not passed that if we had not passed TARP and bailed out um, you know AIG and done all these various extraordinary things, then we'd be looking at a much higher unemployment rate than we have today because we would have had this horrible horrible. Um, bank panic in the in the shadow banking system that would have had really, really terrible effects on the rest of the economy. Uh, that said, I think that well, the manner in which we did this, uh, basically um, having the Treasury Secretary hand out free cash to all of these uh, financial institutions that had, been, that had caused the problem by behaving in extremely responsible ways was um, distasteful to put it extremely mildly that it's it's bad for just kind of democratic governance it's bad from a kind of ethical standpoint it's bad for its redistributionist cons- effects and um hold on i've got a phone ringing here hopefully it will stop uh <laughs> anyway and, and so you know yeah I, I certainly share your distaste for the legislation i just think that as bad as it is and it's bad in a whole lot of different ways it's not as bad as you know, mass unemployment and <laughs> all, all the sorts of really terrible consequences that come from well, me, having a much ahead. more severe recession than we than we are currently experiencing. Let me go ahead and entertain. Let me accept for the moment, for the sake of the argument, that the economy would have collapsed mm. if the government didn't pour seven hundred billion dollars no. into the system. Given that, also let me do something I very rarely do, which is defend John McCain. Is that <laughs> John, McCain John McCain said a couple, okay. of day, a couple of, maybe it was like a month ago, that you know he was lied to by Secretary Paulson, lied to by the Bush administration, mm-hmm. and that they did not do with TARP what they said they were going to do. Mm-hmm. And MSNBC made fun of him, and everyone made fun of him yeah. for this. But he's 100% correct. TARP was sold as buying up all the toxic assets that the mm-hmm. Treasury would hold and then sell later. Yeah. That's what they said they are going to do. They didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Instead, they spent $700 billion buying preferred stock in banks. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they did lie to the American people. They said they were going to do one thing, and they did another. Yeah. But that doesn't forgive John McCain, because I don't forgive him at all, because <laughs> they delegated that authority to the tre- Treasury Secretary so yeah. that they could pull that on him. And you know what? They could have written that legislation so that it was much more clear that saying, you know, we are writing this legislation so that the Treasury Secretary can buy, you know, very sp- and then, you know, name the specific yeah. assets. Uh, well, but they didn't. I, I they think didn't. That instead, I, instead, they punted. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Well, I would add that um, I think a big part of why the legislation was sort of vaguely written was was that it was it's the kind of reg- legislation you write when everyone's essentially in a blind panic about writing policy. I mean, when you start with a situation where I'd say probably like 80 to 90 percent, and I think I'm being generous, of congressmen really didn't have the slightest idea what um, these different kinds of assets that uh, the various financial institutions were were buying and selling were. And I mean, I certainly um, a year ago knew practically nothing at all about what was what had been going on and what was causing this collapse. And even and now I still feel like I barely know anything about it. And I think that the same is true of members of Congress. And that in this kind of crisis atmosphere, uh, you're going to get really sloppily written legislation, which, uh, you know, I think the same is probably true of the Patriot Act and um, uh, all sorts of other Things that uh, all sorts of all sorts of other you know ma- bits of legislation that have been passed like you know, Senate like, health care bills that have to meet a Christmas Day deadline. And the well, it change. didn't meet that I deadline, it did it? Um, deadline. No, yeah, it we, we, the, we keep the Christmas Eve deadline. We, well, like, okay, that, that's I, the one I, that I became did, law. Was the Christmas Eve bill? That's a fair. With the corn record kiss back. We we keep we keep veering into arguing about health care, don't we? 
it is topical these days. Oh, it's very topical. And I, I ordinarily I'm all for arguing about healthcare, but I think we're going to try and we're going to try and get a comparative advantage by not doing that on a website that has like Ezra Klein and Ramesh Paneru because we're both going to look bad. Well, I, I, I see. I see nothing to them, but okay, sure. <laughs> okay, well, I'm seeding something to them for the record. Um, yeah. Well, so I guess going back to the point, sure. I, I'm I'm willing. I'm willing to say that um, TARP is not at all a model, a good model for for legislation. It, um, uh, it yeah, Congress ceded all sorts of authority it shouldn't have ceded, and uh, it, the you know it's a, just incredibly unjust and all these sorts of things. I, it, it just seems like it was uh, an improvement on a horrible alternative. Um, and in fact, I I throw in that. Um, I suspect, although I, I certainly can't prove this, but I, I suspect that more than anything else, um, more than any other like policy that's been pursued over the past uh, year and a half or so, what's responsible for uh, the current administration's unpopularity is is um, the perception that they've just been bailing out uh, Wall Street tycoons and you know shoveling over billions or. Can can we can we accurately say trillions? I don't know. It sort of depends on how you count it. But shoveling over huge amounts of money if you, to these if people you that destroy the, the economy. Fed, then yes. Yeah, yeah, it's in the trillions. Anyway. Um, um, okay. So, so let's transition. Uh, my, <laughs> yes. Yes. My the battery on my uh, my borrowed camera here is flashing. So uh, we Ooh. don't have much. To, I don't know sure. how much time we have, but uh, okay. I think we have at least five minutes or so. Well, um, do, you, do you want to talk about your um your your uh your school board example that you talked about in our previous attempt to uh, tape this? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Um, right, so my, my alternative uh, way to fix the institutions mm-hmm. of Washington is, is, to de- is to devolve power on, on two ways. One, to decrease the uh, bundling, the, the scope of items that Washington uh, covers, and uh, two, to decrease the... Um, Number of people that each uh, representative the, or, or represents. Uh, 